I think Americans obsess a lot over celebrity, but I think that the thing about Britain, you have to remember, is it's a small country. It, you know, there's an expression that they use saying that you punch above your weight, which means you kind of play with the big boys when you're not such a big boy. So Britain, you know, tries to be um, more of a kind of world figure than it maybe is. And so it kind of wants to do what America does, but it doesn't have as many celebrities. It doesn't have um, as many serious things to fill its paper with, papers with, as America does. So it, um, it has this weird celebrity culture filled with not that important celebrities, actually. A lot of newspapers that it has to sell, and a lot of tabloids that are completely um, Hollywoodized. I mean, they're all about kind of crap, really. And, um, and so, so you do, it's, it's in the culture much more. I mean, there is a kind of lack of seriousness and discourse there because of all that, I think. It's really brought down the tone of a lot of the papers, all this celebrity stuff. I interviewed him um, right before The Dark Knight was wrapping. I think he was in his last couple of months of filming. And um, he um, was, you know, he, first of all, he's really good looking. A lot of movie actors aren't good looking at all when you meet them. You know, they're much smaller than you would hope they were which is fine. I have nothing against short people, but, but, you know, but you're disappointed because they don't look the same as you want them to look. And he was like a big, strapping, you know, Australian guy. Um, he clearly was really bright, really creative, very restless, um, and, you know, but charming, and charming and intelligent, and clearly having a tough time with the filming. And one of the things we talked about was insomnia, because I suffer from insomnia as well. So we were sort of trading tips on, you know, what kind of drugs to take and what kind of, you know, techniques we used. And he kind of hauntingly said, you know, I've been taking Ambien, and I took one last night, and it didn't work, so I took another one, and then I only slept for an hour. And he said, you know, my mind is fizzing with this roll. I cannot get my mind to shut up. And he didn't seem like he was, you know, on anything. He just seemed like he was clearly somebody who was one of those people who, who was, gets so into his work that he couldn't calm it down, those voices that were, you know, all excited and fizzy. And so I felt just so sad at the way he died because clearly he was talking about that. And it was, clearly was a mistake, I think, because he just couldn't get any sleep. And I know what that feels like. It's awful. And so it was just shocking because he seemed, he was so full of life and so lovely. And we talked about his daughter. He was, you know, a little baby daughter. He just loved her. And it was just such a waste. It was so sad. And again, you know, I just had, had, would have had no idea. And he certainly wasn't suicidal. He was really full of life. But it was so poignant. He was living in a beautiful rented house in London. And it had, I think, three or four bedrooms. And he took me on a tour beautiful place and he showed me every single bed had been it was all mussy you know all the sheets were everywhere and he said because last night I just couldn't sleep so I went from bed to bed hoping I could fall asleep somewhere <laughs> it's just so sad um, just so sad and you know you wonder if someone had really kind of taken him in hand and said you know let's this movie's hurting your health let's try to work on this if he could have been helped who knows you know creative people are you can't really, you don't really have answers, do you? Um, you can't really know what makes them tick. Um, but it was, it was just, it was a tragedy, a real tragedy.